Thank you, Caitlin. Very beautiful song. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. Now, trellis in a little while, if you can bring it back up, that good-looking picture with the tan jacket. Uh, we want everybody to see that one again. But uh, when I start giving my introduction, uh, it would be a good time to bring the one up on the tan jacket. Okay. First Kings chapter 19, reading verses 8 through 13. The Bible says, And he arose... And did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horb, the mount of God. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountain, and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake... But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice, and it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle, and went out and stood in the entering end of the cave, and behold there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you this morning, and for that privilege, we do say thank you. And as we come, we just pray that, Lord, you look into our hearts, you see what our needs are, and we just pray that each one would be supplied, especially if there's one here who doesn't know your Savior. And, Lord, we just pray, Holy Spirit, you'd convict of sin and draw that one to our Savior, Jesus Christ, for saving. But, Lord, for us who've been saved by your grace, there's so many things that come in our lives sometimes that sort of get us down and out, may get us discouraged. We may sometimes feel a little defeated. And, Lord, sometimes we even drift away from you and get back out there into the world. And we just pray this morning that as we listen to the Word of God, we just pray that you would speak to our hearts to challenge us to be what we ought to be for you. We ask your blessings upon the service this morning and for everyone sent. We say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I told this story here probably 10 or 12 years ago, and uh, it could have been a little longer than that. Uh, because years ago, Judy didn't like, well, number one, she didn't like the way I combed my hair. Uh, but then she got where she didn't like the way I had my hair cut. And so uh, Judy said, you need to do this and you need to do that. And she was telling me how my hair was supposed to be cut. And so I went to my barber at the time, and he says, your hair can't be cut like that. He says, you got fine hair, and you got 100,000 cow licks. It just won't do it. So I came back home, and Judy said, huh, you ought to find another barber. He don't know what he's doing. <laughs> so I go to another barber, and I tell him, you know, my wife wants this, this, and this. And he said the same thing the other guy said. He said, preacher, you got 100,000 cow licks and fine hair. It can't be done. So I go home and tell Judy, he don't know what he's doing either. You need to find another barber. So I go to another fellow, and he says the same thing the first two said. So finally Judy says, my beautician could do it. So I said, okay, you line it up. So she lined it up, and it was down there by, you know what I'm talking about. It was uh, okay. Uh, we, w we went, and I walked in, and when I got out of my car, Judy was going to meet me there. She was already standing on the inside, and I was just like this. You know, I was looking around, and when I walked in, the lady said, what's the problem? I said, ma'am, I wouldn't be any more nervous if I was standing in a liquor store looking to wait and see if one of my church members was going to pass. And so I, I sat down in the chair, and I kept, you know, it was almost like this, just in case somebody did walk by the window. And uh, she said, how's things going? I said, ma'am, it don't make any difference how things are going. I just want you to know this is your one and only chance. <laughs> I said, even if you do what my wife wants done, it ain't going to be done here again, you know. 
uh, if, if it takes place, then I'll just go to the barbershop and say, this is what my wife wanted, you know, and so, uh, you know, fix it that way from then on. Well, about the next Sunday, you know, it was then cut. Well, it still won't like she wanted it, but, you know, the woman did her thing, and I came to church, and Miss Bland said, are you wearing a wig? <laughs> and Ronnie Little said, Miss Bland, you know a head of hair looks like that. Ain't nobody going to pay money for it. <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> and, but when I was sitting in that chair, I kept, you know, the lady was working, and I kept looking like that, and the lady said, you seem to be bothered quite a bit. What's the matter? I said, ma'am, there's only one thing running across my mind. She said, what's that? I said, what in the world are you doing here? You know, and I said, so do your thing, but I won't ever come back. You know, if you just, I don't care, I won't be back. And uh, that's why I pick on, you know, on fellas, whatever, but I'll still hang to the barbershop, okay? Uh, as I told one lady, I went to the wonderful barbershop, was going to get my hair cut, and she said, David's not here right now, but I'd be glad to work in. I said, ma'am, last time Baptist preacher got a woman to cut his hair, he lost all his power. I said, so, uh, I said, I'll wait for David to come back, you know. And so, this morning, I want to preach on that. What in the world are you doing here? You know, and I think God sometimes comes down as he did with Elijah, and he looks at us, you and I, who are children of God, and he asks us that question, what in the world are you doing here? Now, as we look at the story, we're going to find that Israel was in a state of almost famine. Uh, bad times had come. There was drought, and, you know, things were, were getting kind of tough. Ahab and Jezebel were sitting on the throne there of Israel, two of the wickedest people that had ever come down the road. Uh, and the, because things are bad, Elijah's being blamed for it. Now, you know, anytime things goes bad here in the country, uh, it's Christian folks going to be blamed for it. And in one sense, we are the blame for it because God tells us if we'd get right, then, you know, we could bring revival back to the land. And so, uh, Pretty much that may be the case. But anytime things go bad, it's always the Christian folks that seem to be the problem. But we notice that Ahab sends a messenger and he says, I want you to find Elijah and tell him that uh, we need to have a meeting. And so uh, nobody wanted to meet any more than Elijah did. And so Elijah decides to meet. And as soon as they meet, oh, Ahab asked the question that's found in 1 Kings 18, 17, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And, you know, uh, it's not the fundamentalists that's causing trouble in America right now. Uh, brother, it's always been the liberal crowd. Uh, they're the ones that got all the ideas that always seem to take us down the tube. Now, uh, Ahab said, are thou he who troubles Israel? And old Elijah comes right back and says, no, sir, but it's you and your dad's house. You know, uh, it's the wickedness you brought. You've slain the prophets. You've broken down the altars. You've broken the covenant, got away from the covenant. That was with God. Said, and because of sin, God has sent what, what is taking place right now. Now, Elijah said, uh, we need to find out because your wife has brought in all these false gods that she wants to worship, Baal and some others. He said, so I'll tell you what I like to do. He says, those 400 prophets of the grove and those 450 prophets of Baal, uh, all those guys that eat at your wife's table. Uh, he said, I like for you to get them together. He says, and I'd like to have a contest up there on Mount Carmel. He says, we'll get a lamb, slay it, put it on the altar. And the God that answers by fire will be the God that, that Israel will worship. And so the contest seemed pretty good to, to the king. Uh, and, you know, there was nobody wanted to come to Jesus meeting better than Elijah because he knew which God was going to answer by fire. Uh, and so they meet. And uh, I, I always will believe that Elijah had a little bit of Jones in him because now if I can heck with you a little bit, get under your skin, I will. You know, I enjoy it. And uh, uh, in fact, if I find out that you don't enjoy it, I'll enjoy it a little bit more. You know, uh, uh, that, that's just my nature sometimes. There's that streak. And so I can see old Elijah when he, he met there on Mount Carmel and he says, I tell you what, you guys go first. You know, and I can see these guys as they there, the sacrifices on the altar, and here's these 850 false prophets, and they're screaming and hollering, trying to get Baal or whatever God they're, they're praying to, uh, to answer by fire. And so old Elijah, you know, he begins to heckle a little bit. He says, why don't you do to holler a little bit louder? You know, uh, he may be sleeping because y'all are a little dull anyway. And, you know, they're cutting themselves and screaming, you know, trying to get a little blood, trying to get, get Baal's attention. He says, 
says, you know, old boy might be off on a hunting trip somewhere. Says, oh, he might be asleep. And so uh, on and on, you know, he, he just heckles. Uh, and I'm sure he said, now, fellas, what's wrong? You know, we've gone from early morning and it's getting noontime now. You know, he says, if you ain't wore your wore bail out, he said, you're about to wear me out. You know, says, uh, and that old boy, he ain't answered yet. And so I, I kind of get, you know, when they start screaming and hollering, if I'd have been Elijah, I'd have screamed and hollered and mocked them a little bit. Now, I wouldn't have cut myself, but I would have pretended to, you know, I'd have probably had me some fake blood or something. I'd have just had a good time uh, mocking those guys. In fact, you know, I got me a little poem that I, I, I got here that I'd have probably hollered at him and said about lunchtime, you know, when they'd been going from morning to, to about noon, I'd have hollered, hey, cool it. You've done your best. That cutting and hollering, let's give it a rest. You wasted your breath and you wasted your blood. Jehovah's God, oh, Bill's a dud. You know, so uh, I just said, you know, just, just cool it. And so, uh, you know, and only Elijah, one guy, you know, and, and I love that. One man, just one guy who was courageous enough to stand against 850 false prophets. You know, he goes up there by himself. He doesn't have a cheering squad. He doesn't have anybody hollering, amen, glory, hallelujah, you know, cheered him on against these 850 guys. He's all by himself. And so then he says, fellas, it's my turn. He says, now, I'll tell you what I want you to do. He says, I want you to pour water on the sacrifice and on the altar. And I can see those 850 guys say, well, wait a minute. Pour water on it? Man, you're going to wet everything down? You can't burn wet wood. And I can hear old Elijah when he says, yeah, well, you're forgetting something. I ain't serving old buzzard breath bail. You know, I'm serving the God of Israel who never fails. And brother, you know, and God did answer by fire. And as soon as God answered by fire, old Elijah said, you know, kill them dudes. And brother, they cut the heads off of those 850 guys. I mean, they killed those false prophets. Now, as soon as all those 850 false prophets had been killed and they were Jezebel's preachers, uh, she sent word to Elijah, you a dead man. You know, as soon as I get a hold of you, I'm going to do to you what you did to those fellas. And so uh, Elijah takes off and runs. Now, you know, the more I think about that, he's a smart man. Uh, the moral of that story is one woman bent out of shape is more furious than 850 guys. You know, so, uh, so you fellas might want to watch it sometime. I love picking on you ladies. Uh, but... You know, Elijah took off. Now, the thing that I love, old Elijah runs and hides himself. Uh, the Bible tells us that he takes off. Uh, he runs about 100 miles south to Bathsheba, then a day's journey into the wilderness, and sits under a juniper tree and begins to whine and tell God, you know, I'm the only one left. Now, then he says, you know, he gets a little discouraged down and out, and he tells God he wants to die. Now, I've said this a, a hundred times here. You know, any of us would know that old boy was lying. I mean, if you want to die, why do you want to waste all that energy running 100 miles? Just sit where you were. You know, Jezebel doesn't say it. I'll do it for you. You know, I'll kill you. And so uh, if he'd really want to die, he could have just stayed there. Uh, but he took off and, and he ran and he kept telling God, I'm the only one. Now, God comes along and we know what the, the Bible tells us there, that there came wind, there came fire, there came earthquake. God wasn't so much in those things, but then there came a still small voice. And God asked the same question in verse 13 that uh, he had asked up in verse 9. When he said, now, Elijah, what in the world are you doing here? And Elijah says, you know, I'm the only one left. And God says, yeah, but you were the man up there against 850 false prophets all by yourself. You're the fellow who prayed down the fire. He says, and here you are running from a woman and hiding in a cave. And he says, I want to know what you're doing here. Now, you know, when I think about that and Elijah comes back, he says, well, you know, I'm the only one left. Now, God says that he has about 7,000 who hasn't bowed at need a bell yet. And I have in another sermon, where were those 7,000? You know, they don't been here cheering this old boy on and it would have been a great encouragement to him. But when I look at Elijah, he goes whining about, I'm the only one left. Now, had I been God and I'm 
I'm thankful that, you know, I, I'm not because I'd have probably done this old boy like God did Job. I'd have asked him a few questions and showed him a few things. When he said, I'm the only one left, I'd have looked at him and said, yeah, well, there won't nobody but me and you when you were up there on Mount Carmel. There won't nobody but me and you when you stood against 850 guys. There won't nobody but me and you when fire fell from heaven. Now, if just me and you was enough then, why ain't me and you enough now? You know, and let me tell you, you know, there's sometimes when you and I are on top side, sometimes there's nobody but me, me and God. And sometimes it's just you and God. Now, when you get down in the valley and you think everybody else is gone, why ain't God enough? You know, why can't you just say, well, Lord, it's just me and you again. And so uh, uh, you can meet the need. And so... Elijah got to where he was in a place of discouragement, and when he did, God says, what in the world are you doing here? God says, now, you're the fellow who just saw a miracle. You're the fellow who saw fire fall from heaven. You're the guy who saw the, the sacrifice consumed up off the altar. Said, you just saw revival. You just heard the people scream and holler that uh, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. He says, now, of all the folks in the world, you ought to be on top side. He said, but here you are in a place of discouragement. And I want to ask you a question. What in the world are you doing here? Now, I want to ask you a question this morning if you're a Christian. What in the world are you doing here if you're in a place of discouragement? And, you know, you say, well, I'm just feeling a little blue. I'm a little depressed. I'm a little down in the dumps. Well, get out of the dumps and sit on the side of the dumpster. At least get that far. You know, but, you know, lift your, when I say lift yourself up, uh, when I say, you know, there's some things to think about. Isn't your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? You know, isn't your name recorded in heaven? Brother, that ought to be enough to shout about right there. You know, that ought to be enough to put a smile on your face, put a lift in your step when you walk. You know, haven't your sins been forgiven? Uh, you know, when I say, haven't they been erased? Not only from the, the records in heaven, but haven't they been erased from the memory of God? Because didn't God say that he promised to remember them no, no more? Uh, and so, you know, what in the world are you doing in a place of discouragement? God says, now, Elijah, get out of that cave. Now, let's notice where that cave was. That cave was on Mount Horeb. You know, that was the place Moses had got the Ten Commandments. That was the mountain of God. And so, brother, here was a guy who, who rumbled that mountain one more time there, like, like he had done it when he gave the commandments to Moses. Moses. Now he says, now what in the world are you, you doing here? He said, you stood against the false prophets. You stood before Ahab and, and you weren't afraid. He says, I sent fire. I performed a miracle. He says, the people have shouted uh, and they know who the true and living God is. Now he said, so why are you discouraged? What in the world are you doing here? He looks at him. He said, aren't you a child of God? And I ask you that question this morning. Aren't you a child of God? Aren't you joint heirs with Jesus Christ? Uh, aren't you saved? You know, as I said a while ago, aren't you justified? Aren't you, your sins washed away? Uh, so why in the world should you and I be discouraged? Now, if you, you'd read the, the Bible and read about the life of King David, uh, I don't think you'll find a fellow outside of maybe Job who faces any more trials and heartaches and disappointments than David did. But if you read the Psalms, you won't find anybody who praised God more than what David did. Now, you know, I, I think that's the thing that will lift us out of discouragement sometimes if rather than always looking down into dumps, brother, if you'll start looking toward heaven and realize your name's written there, you'll find enough to praise the Lord about that you can push discouragement away. Now, as I said, isn't heaven your home? Isn't God your father? Isn't Christ your savior? Isn't the Bible your book? Isn't the Holy Spirit your joy and your, your power? Isn't the rapture your hope this morning? I mean, uh, why in the world should a chin drag the ground? You know, if anybody Everybody ought to be on top side. It ought to be us. Uh, you know, this old world is never going to believe that Jesus is the answer if God's people can't prove it to them. You know, in Psalm 126, I love what it says there. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dreamed. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Brother, here was folks who were freed from bondage and were on the way home. And let me tell you something this morning. I've been saved by God's grace. And if you're a Christian, you've been saved by God's grace. We've been released from the bondage of sin and we're on our way home. If ever a crowd ought to sing, if ever a crowd ought to laugh, it ought to be, you know, us. Now, I realize that a lot of Christians don't believe you're supposed to laugh, and especially in church. But, you know... Uh, I plan to have a good time now. I plan to have a good time when I get to heaven. Uh, 
A lot of you who have never laughed going to laugh when you go through the gates because you're just going to be shocked that you got there. Uh, you know, uh, it's going to be good to you. Uh, so, uh, but, you know, here was a crowd, the heathen crowd, when they saw God's people laughing and they heard God's people singing. You know what they said? The Lord has done great things for them. And let me tell you something. Uh, if the Lord's done great things for you, to be sure we can smile, to be sure we can laugh, to be sure that uh, we can do some singing, uh, to me, God's people ought to be a singing people, ought to be, when I say, a laughing people. And so God looks at Elijah and says, what in the world are you doing in the place of discouragement? He says, doesn't Romans 8, 9 says that the Holy Spirit lives in you? Doesn't Romans 8, 28 say that all things work together for good to them who are called uh, according to who love God and are called according to his purpose. He says, doesn't Roman or Philippians 4, 13 say, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Doesn't Philippians 4, 19 say, but my God shall supply all you need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Doesn't Psalm 91, 1 say, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. Does it Psalm 34, 7 say, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart? Does it Psalm 23, 1 say, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want? You know, Elijah, what in the world are you doing here in the place of discouragement? Now, he says, Get on top side and have a spell. You know, you're a child of God. And so uh, when I, I look at him there in that cave, and brother, had I been God, I said, why are you standing in the door of the cave with that mantle wrapped around your face when you ought to be there at the Jordan River with that mantle parting the waters? Brother, you know, there's power there. You need to be out there using it. So this morning, if you're a Christian, I want to ask you, what in the world are you doing in the place of discouragement? And if you sort of just feel like, well, you have just not only discouraged, well, preacher, I'm discouraged because I'm defeated. The devil or the world or whatever has just put a whipping on me, and, and I just feel like Elijah when he says, I'm the only one left. And like I said, God said, that's all it took on Mount Carmel. You know, that's all it took to get the fire. That's all it took to get the, the prayers answered. You know, one was enough. Now, let me tell you, that one brought revival to, to the nation of Israel because he was the one who proved who the true and living God was. Uh, tonight, we fix and go through. I hope it's not a week of just meetings, but brother, we want a revival. And, and just one person who wants one uh, can come and spark the fire like, like Elijah did. Now, when the Lord says to him... Now, what are you doing here in the place of discouragement? What are you doing here in the place of defeat? Because uh, when Elijah says, I'm the only one left, uh, the Lord says, you know, Romans 8, 37 says, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And that word conquerors means unbeatable, undefeatable. He says, now, if you're undefeatable, what in the world are you doing defeated? You know, uh, what kind of God do we have? You know, God was all he needed up there on the mountain, there at Mount Carmel. Uh, so if you leave the mountain, has God changed? You know, I, I've said this here, and Miss Bundy, forgive me for picking on Mr. Bundy this morning without getting your permission, but the very first year that I came here as pastor and got a chance to go to, to Cragmont, now, I, I, I came to enjoy it and, and love Mr. Bundy tremendously, but uh, Mr. Bundy had a whole lot more fun at Cragmont than he did here sometimes. Uh, the first time I got to Cragmont and, you know, Mr. Richard was cutting up him and the Sunshine Girls, I thought, now, is this the same guy who leads the choir? back at the, the church and takes everything very seriously. And, you know, I take the Lord's business very seriously, but uh, I don't have to ride from here to Cragmont to have a good time. Uh, you know, just to, I started to say let my hair down, but I, I kind of let it out now. Uh, <laughs> now, if he showed the picture a little earlier, you know, you could, uh, if I'd gone to the beauty shop, they had something to work with. <laughs> Uh, now if I go, it would be the good hair piece probably, you know, it's all about, about gone. Uh, but what I thought, now, why have I got to go somewhere else to have a good time? And Elijah, he had a good time up there on Mount Carmel heckling those guys and then finally showing who the true and living God was. Well, why have you got to change when you come down off the mountain? When you came off the mountain, doesn't the same Holy Spirit live on the inside? 
Isn't the same God the, still your Father? Is it Jesus Christ still your Savior? And so, you know, nothing has changed. Uh, though Elijah is now saying, I'm the only one. You know, Genesis 18, 14 still asked, is there anything too hard for God? You know, if nothing was too hard for him on the mountain, nothing's going to be too hard for him down here in the valley or on flat land. You know, and Jeremiah answered that question in Jeremiah 32, 17, when he said, there is nothing too hard for God. You know, Luke one thirty one says, all things with God, all th uh, nothing shall be impossible. So, you know, there's not, why do I need to be defeated? Uh, there's nothing I'm going to face that God can't handle. Uh, there's nothing I'm going to face that God can't bring me through. Uh, Luke 18, 27 says, with God, nothing shall be impossible. Uh, in Matthew 17, 20, nothing shall be impossible unto you. In Matthew 19, 26, with God, all things are possible. Mark 10, 27, with God, all things are possible. Mark 9, 23, all things are possible to him that believes. And I think that's how trouble sometimes is our faith begins to waver. 1 John 4, 4 says, greater is he that's within you than he that's within the world. There's no need for the devil to whip us. Now, I love it sometimes that, to pick on the folks that will tell me, and maybe you've heard it. Anybody ever told you, I'm going to do something the devil won't do? And they say, I'm going to leave you. And I always tell them, the devil will do that too. The Bible says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. You know, so uh, you ain't doing nothing the devil you know, won't do if I just put up a little resistance there. Uh, but, you know, sometimes folks sort of get down when I say not only discouraged, but get defeated when people say, uh, somebody's spreading gossip about me. Somebody's spreading scandal about me. Somebody has it in for me. So what? The Bible says in Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. You know, so as long as it's false, don't worry about it. You know, just keep on going. You know, Elijah, didn't your God part the waters of the Red Sea? Elijah, didn't your God make the sun stand still for Joshua? Elijah, didn't your God feed those three million Jews for 40 years, you know, out there in the desert and give them water? Uh, I know Elijah hadn't seen the New Testament yet, but, you know, I like to go back and remind him that uh, God raised Lazarus from the grave. But, you know, he's going to be a guy that's going to see God raise a widow's son to life. You know, don't you remember the power that God has? Uh, you know, God fed all, all those Israelites. Don't you think God can take care of you? You might be one, but like I said a while ago, uh, just you and him were enough on Mount Carmel. Don't, don't you think just you and him's enough now? Uh, you know, look. The God you and I have is not some puny little guy that's a grandfather up there in heaven that's fickled and feeble this morning. Brother, let me tell you something. He's just as powerful as he's always been. I mean, the same one that spoke this old world into existence is still our God this morning. And so there's no need, there's no reason for a Christian to be defeated. And that's what God says. What in the world are you doing here in the place of discouragement? What in the world are you doing here in the place of defeat? And then he says, what in the world are you doing back in the world? Now, when Elijah had done his running and got to, to the cave out there in uh, the wilderness and, and all, uh, he was no longer there in what I call the, the Holy Land area. He, he left that area. And so God is asking you and I sometimes as Christians, what in the world are you doing here? You know, I think God looks sometimes down in the theater and God says, what in the world are you doing here? I think God looks sometimes at some of the, I don't care if it's rock or country, uh, some of the concerts and says, what in the world are you doing here? I think God looks at some of the trashy uh, magazine stands sometimes at Christians and say, what in the world are you doing here? Uh, you know, I think he, he just looks at some of the, the taverns, the clubs, the night places, and there are Christians there and God says, what in the world are you doing here? And then I think, you know, uh, since I've hit those places, I may as well go on down the list. I think when it comes Sunday night and Wednesday night, when you and your lazy boy, God says, what in the world are you doing here? You know, got some things going on down at church. Now, you know, you, you're Christian folks. Uh, we're going to have revival this week, but guess what? Now, I... Uh, I'm not going to be able to embarrass you because you're not able. Well, there's only a few things going to embarrass me. I remember one night we were over in the old sanctuary. I was supposed to be holding revival at a church up there around a Spring Hope. Uh, they were starting on Sunday night, and I'd forgotten about it. 
I'd preached here and gone over to the office. The phone was ringing, so I went and answered the phone, and it was Buddy Rogerson. Buddy said, where are you? I said, where'd you call? You know, I said, he said, I called your church. I said, that's where I'm at. He said, what well, you were supposed to be here. We started revival tonight. I said, I missed it. <laughs> I said, I'll be there tomorrow night. He said, luckily, and brother, I, let me tell you something. If old Doug don't show, I got one in my Bible right now, okay? I learned a long time ago, you don't depend on the guy. Show. He could be in a wreck. Anything could happen. He said, I'm just glad that the visiting choir, the preacher was with him from the First Baptist Church and said he preached tonight. I said, I went to church the next night and there was three or four folks when I walked to the pulpit who was sitting sort of down front and said, I bet you embarrassed because you missed last night, aren't you? I said, no, sir, because I bet you I won't be the only one who misses the night this week. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all of them kind of went zip, like I said. Now, you can get the best of it, but you better be on your toes. And I was sorry that I missed the night. I really was. But guess what? A lot of folks ain't sorry they missed the night, you know. In fact, some sorry that they came tonight. But, uh, you know, but the Lord asked the question, what in the world are you doing here? You know, you're Christian people. And, you know, I, that's what's wrong with the world right now as they look at us. They see too many Christians back out there in the world. And God is supposed to make a difference in my life and yours. Now, you know, when God looked at Elijah and he says, now, you're my man. You're my child. You belong to me. He says, now, what in the world are you doing down there in a place of discouragement? Brother, if I can lift you up there on Mount Carmel, I can lift you anywhere. God says, what are you doing defeated? If me and you could win up there, me and you could win anywhere. And God says, I want to know what you're doing back out there in the world, you know. Uh, and let me ask you a question. You know, God has saved you. And brother, weren't we glad he got us out of that place to begin with? So why in the world do we want to go back? Now, this morning, you know, God says if you're sitting in a pew and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, God says, what in the world are you doing here? God says, if you know that there's a heaven and there's a hell and you're not saved, God says, what you doing here? You know, he says, they're going to be given the invitation in a little while. And brother, if you die without Jesus Christ and die and go to hell, God will definitely have to say, what in the world are you doing here? You know, God says, you didn't have to come. This place wasn't prepared for you. It was prepared for the devil and his angels, you know, but you made the choice. Now, this morning, you discouraged, you defeated, you back out there in the world. God says, what in the world are you doing here? Now, let me ask you a question. What in the world are you doing here? Why'd you come? Now, if you came for something, you know, I'll be honest with you. I come to be lifted. I come to be fed. I come to be encouraged. I come to get some fellowship. And brother, let me tell you something. I ain't coming and leaving in worse shape than I was when I come. If I come looking for something, and I'm not trying to run anybody off, but here's what I'll tell you. If I'm going somewhere and this is what I'm looking, and after a while I ain't getting it, I'll go where I can find it. And uh, I'm hoping this morning you came because you said, Preacher, you know, I've been discouraged, but I wanted to be lifted. God's Word can do it. Preacher, I feel like I've gone a few rounds with the devil and about, about to lose. Well, let me tell you, you know, that's once again, that's why we have this. When it says, Greater is He within us than within the world. So we, and, you know, when we leave here, the, you know, you and I got to be like the Israelites. God told them when they left Egypt going to, to the Promised Land, God says, Now you got to go through Moab. And you got to go through some other places. God says, but don't veer to the left, don't veer to the right. There's some things you're going to have to purchase along the way, but don't mingle and meddle with them folks. Now, you just stay on the highway and go. Now, brother, you and I have been saved by God's grace. We're going to heaven when we die. And God says, you got to go through this old world to get there, but don't be mingling and meddling back out there in the world. God says, stay on the highway. Stay on the straight and narrow. And this morning, I think if you'll stay on the straight and there, you see, this is the problem, you know, when those folks got headed to the promised land, you know, there's too many of us, and I do it now because, well, she does it too, and that's what scares me. You know, if I'm driving, you do the sightseeing. I look down the road. If you're driving, I'll do the sightseeing. You look down the road. I've often said, I don't know when and where I'll die, but I do know how, <laughs> you know. 
It'd be in the passenger side of our truck, you know, <laughs> meeting something she didn't see. So uh, while she's talking to somebody else, I'm talking to the Lord, you know, keep, keep the eyes there. Now, see, those folks got, got in trouble on the way to the promised land because they were always sightseeing. God had said, you got to buy from, but don't mingle. But, you know, they were always looking to see if somebody had something out there a little bit better. You know, if Moab had something to offer that we don't have. Brother, you know, if you're not looking, you don't know. If all you know is what God has offered you, you'll be satisfied. And let me tell you, that all the glitter and glamour, once they draw you off the straight and narrow out there, you're going to find out that it's not better than what you had anyway. I share this story in close. I've always heard that grass is always greener on the other side. And years ago, I was going to Raleigh Durham Airport to pick up something for my dad, and there was a cow with her head stuck through a fence eating grass on the shoulder of the road. When I came back, that cow was out of the pen with her head stuck back through <laughs> eating grass in the pasture. And I sat there and laughed and laughed, and I thought, you know, I'd always heard, but now that old cow proved it to me. <laughs> and let me tell you something. If you're, if you're following the good Lord, I don't care what is out there on the side. There is nothing out there that, but only is going to entangle you. There's nothing out there that is better than what the Lord offers. So you make sure when he asks, what in the world are you doing here? You're going to be in a place that you're proud of. This morning, if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I'll tell you what you're doing here. You came by appointment because God wanted you to hear a gospel message, wanted you to have a chance to respond to an invitation to receive His Son as your Savior. And this morning, as we give the invitation, we'd like for you to come. Or well, what are you doing here? You've been saved by God's grace. Well, God can supply any other need. All you have to do is come as we sing the first, the last stanza of hymn number 371. Hymn number 371. We have a young lady this morning, her name is Miss Jasmine Davis, who comes and like to unite with our church. Uh, she'd been saved, she'd been baptized, and she said, uh, she said, I, I was a member of a church while I was in Germany, but I don't been gone so long, I don't know whether the membership's there or not. But this morning, she'd like to unite with our church, and what's the pleasure of our church? A have a motion and a second. Any questions or discussion? All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. aye. Any opposed, say no. I'd like to be the first to congratulate you. Thank you for being a part. Ask you fellas to start it off.
I do encourage you to remember revival this week. Start tonight at 7, each night at 7.30. We'd love to have you. Let's bow for our benediction. Father, how we thank you this morning for the blessings you send our way. We thank you so much for your goodness and grace. Do go with us, watch over us, bless and use us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.